Um, so what where, what is on demand play the role? And then uh, in the left corner, um, whether or not you're a supporter or not, but uh, this term of trackless trams, rubber tied merit metro, I've kind of coined the, tire, the term like rail. Um, and so that's the one that was kind of uh, designed up on the Sunshine Coast, but have been involved in a couple of studies in Victoria and New South Wales. But primarily what I want to kind of talk to uh, um, and what's sort of getting excited where um, I hope uh, will improve, improve some customer outcomes is particularly around um, electric buses. Um, and you kind of go, yeah, so what? Um, and hopefully um, I will make a bunch of champions out of everybody on the Zoom call today. So you'll all run out and expect zero emission buses to be running in your municipality soon. Um, one thing that's been quite sort of fascinating, I've been kind of often looking at the um, bus patronage data in Melbourne and since around 2012, 13, there's been very steady declines uh, in bus patronage. Um, there have been some increases in certain lines. One of the things, you know, it's interesting talking to people. Some people think, oh, maybe is the data corrupted? But there's kind of two interesting things that happened in 2012. One was Mikey uh, got fully implemented. The third one in late 2012 is um, Uber arrived. And so the, you know, with COVID, um, the changing demographics, the, the changing expectations people have for buses that sometimes can't be seen as sexy, particularly in Melbourne, as we're not a bus city, um, is starting to say, well, look, you know, the declines are quite phenomenal. Um, what is the rethink? What is the product? And how do we improve uh, buses uh, or the service that is provided? So, and that's where I suppose is, you know, there's a whole bunch of other things you can do with buses, whether it's on demand or replanning. But what I wanted to kind of talk about the aspect today is really about electric buses and potentially the role again that has in decarbonisation, but also improving service. So electric buses, um, 99%, uh, so 17% of the world's buses are electric already. 99% of them are in China. Shenzhen uh, transitioned all 18,000 buses uh, back in, started in 2015 and completed that um, outcome in 2018. Phenomenal BYD, if you have a chance, Google it. Phenomenal transition that most people don't, don't recognize. Uh, around 100,000 buses in Australia burning around 7,000 litres a day, which is around 18, 18 metric tonnes of CO2 a year. Um, you know, if we think about a thousand buses, you know, it's kind of the equivalent uh, of 500 barrels of oil a day. So we are burning a lot of uh, fossil fuel uh, that's going into air quality. 3,000 people a year die uh, for air quality um, issues in Australia. But also we know that, you know, particularly large arterial roads, that um, asthma is quite more prevalent along those roads. Um, and so, you know, taking those particulates out of the air is really important. Uh, Europe, 3,000 buses. Uh, hydrogens, uh, so I'll, I'll use the term battery electrics. That's a, bat, that's a bus with a big battery on it. Um, and then we talk about hydrogen or fuel cell buses. Not as many fuel cell buses currently happening. If there are questions about hydrogen, happy to uh, answer those, but I probably won't go too much into hydrogen today because it's um, a little bit less developed, um, but there are particular use cases around waste collection trucks that I'm currently looking at, but slightly different conversation. Uh, a lot of trials going on in Australia. Um, I like this use case. So this is Transit Systems Australia, uh, Transit Systems in, uh, so we're looking at some of their data, really interesting. Um, we've so far can predict around 80% of all buses in Sydney could go battery electric uh, tomorrow. Um, about 20%, probably a little bit long. Melbourne's a little bit different given the tram network and given some of the longer routes like the orbitals. Um, but, you know, a lot of bus routes, particularly in inner Melbourne or short routes, uh, could go tomorrow. Um, so that's just an example, seven, 370 kilowatt battery, uh, goes out, drives 175 Ks, comes back, does a 60 minute charge, and then does another 175 Ks, comes back with a third of battery. And that's what we're seeing. That's including air conditioning. That's a 30 degree day uh, with slight hills in Sydney. So um, the technology is there and uh, it's, it's definitely uh, ready to go. So what happened was when I, and I am going to go through the, the report that we've done, but I think it's really interesting just to kind of think about what's happened in the last four months since we had this um, zero emissions bus forum. So we recently held a, a regional forum, our open transport for New South Wales. Uh, about 270 people came, we did a whole bunch of research. Since then, we've had a commitment from the New South Wales Minister to convert all 8,000 bu uh, state buses to battery electric by, or I should say zero emissions by 2030. 
they've already they'll have 50 new electric buses out on the road soon. AC2, who we've been working with, have put a complete ban on diesel bus purchases. Currently procuring 90. Uh, Queensland um, have said, look, all buses purchased by 2030 will be zero emissions, uh, and we're currently involved in a in a trial uh, on the Gold Coast with BusTech. South Australia have made a promise. Uh, so we are kind of trying to hold them to account. And if some of you are aware, Vic has, uh, Victoria has been running that uh, one electric bus, I think with Transdev, uh, and has committed another 20 million to a three year trial. Uh, New Zealand, bit of a shout out to them. New, uh, Wellington will have a completely electric fleet by 2027. Auckland uh, are now aiming to have a full electric fleet uh, by 2030. So these are massive statistics um, and hopefully um, we'll uh, see the ramifications from it. So tomorrow I'm actually releasing another research report uh, and I'll talk about that at the end, um, but this report was released uh, just in October and the way it was done, it was done through a number of interview styles, uh, talked to a lot of people across our globally, a uh, number of transport operators across the region and also bus manufacturers and really wanted to kind of understand where they were at, what they thought the opportunities were, what the role of government and what they needed. Um, so we could really kind of use this as a discussion paper for the Zero Emissions Bus Forum. So outcomes and opportunities. So why do it? You know, it's always good to co create the burning platform. Look, I've already talked about climate change and emissions. Um, so, you know, all the particulates that are coming out from diesel, trying to meet our, our climate change goals. Um, one of the things is, you know, cleaner air is, is realistic. And with one thing we've noticed, I suppose, in particular with COVID, um, is this idea around uh, resilience and security. So the ability to manufacture the vehicles here, not being reliant on uh, a foreign uh, fuel source, we can generate it here from clean renewable energy. Um, and it's about kind of having that energy resilience and security. One thing I think is usually underestimated is next generation jobs. So we're talking about um, these vehicles being manufactured here. So I'll talk from a Victorian sense. So we've got two really great manufacturers, Volgren and um, generally up in Ballarat. When we talk about next generation jobs, this is, you know, um, the design, the putting together, um, you know, starting to think about a clean, uh, new, advanced, 3D printing, advanced manufacturing sector. So when we start to think about these vehicles being built, um, we are doing it ourselves and putting them out on the road. So the more that we can encourage, um, I suppose, the state uh, to replace as many buses as possible, particularly in COVID as a, an economic recovery, could be a real bounce forward uh, in it. And, you know, some people have said, you know, going away from this kind of dirty diesel, um, does it actually attract more people into the industry? Would people that are kind of feel a little bit excluded may actually go, well, this is actually a job that, you know, I'd really want to be involved in rather than trying to um, create that. Some people talked about a new product or service offering. You know, this is where start, people start to talk about trackless trams or, you know, is the service quality of an electric bus? You can see the Melbourne, uh, the Brisbane Metro bus there. Um, we don't even like to call it a bus. We like to call it a you know rubber tired metro, um, because it is a completely different vehicle. A feel you know you can plug in your USB charger. Um, it rides has ride quality. I don't want to say like a tram, but a much much smoother ride quality. And then um, starting to think uh, about that. One of the, the pictures there is from the, the Victorian uh, Urban Roads and Streets uh, Guide that was developed for the DOT. Um, it's actually something um, Arab did. If and by the way, if you do want to know more about that, have, have happy for you to email me and I can give you some more information on that. But one thing around electric buses, you know, if, if anybody's been on Ligon Street, um, you know, thinking about outdoor dining with a big rumbling diesel bus next to you or cycling next to a big diesel bus versus a very quiet um, zero emissions vehicle is quite a different and it allows us to kind of rethink what our roads and streets and what even a bus interchange looks at. Lastly, maintenance and operations uh, is massive. You know, we already know that over the life cycle of these vehicles, they are cheaper to run, they are more reliable, um, uh, they break down less. The problem at the moment is that a diesel bus is quite cheap to buy. It's around 450,000. A battery electric bus is starting to push around 700, 750. And if you're only running a bus network for 10 years, of course, your capital expenditure becomes really important to you. But then if we put that over the life of the bus of 20 years, um, if zero emissions buses outperform um, uh, diesel buses. And so what we're trying to encourage in terms of business cases and finance, how can we make sure that people are taking a more longer term view?
Uh, and it's called social license to operate. Um, you know, I'm starting to think now that I know all of this stuff about zero emissions buses, I'm starting to say, well, why are we still buying diesel buses? Uh, and so there is a kind of social license, you know, uh, element there in terms of saying, well, look, we need to um, cut our emissions, but we are still putting brand new diesel buses on the road. Um, and do we need to be doing that? Oh, I've touched on some of this stuff before. I think there is an issue around time horizons. So we talk about bus franchises only lasting 10. The vehicles usually go to about 17 to 20. The return on investment can be up to 30. So you imagine the depots, um, you know, when we think about transitioning them to zero emissions. Um, and hopefully, as I said before, hopefully I'm growing some champions in this room and starting to create uh, some momentum around making sure that we've got a zero emissions bus roadmap, making sure that we are thinking around this modern uh, technology that we can build here uh, in Australia and thinking about uh, using renewable energy to run our network. What I want to just say is buying electric bus is one of the most easiest things you can do at the moment. Uh, we're manufacturing them here in Australia. Um, that's the easy bit. It's kind of the whole um, ecosystem, and I suppose, transition uh, around that. Um, that is some sometimes some of the things that people are still uh, struggling with a little bit. Uh, so what I mean by that is... Um, you know, when we start to think around, you know, if like say for instance, hydrogen, there's no point switching a bus to hydrogen if you're gonna create hydrogen from brown coal. Um, you know, how do we make sure there's capacity in the energy network? How do we make sure that um, financing is available? Making sure that we're doing enough trials to transition. So that bus that's actually on that screen, um, Arup actually ended up owning a bus company, believe it or not. Um, so we had Milton Keynes Council and we had Arriva, the operator, and neither wanted to own the buses. So we actually bought the, the five buses and created our own leasing company. And that was to get that trial up and running in 2016, 17. So that's been quite phenomenal. Um, so as you can see there, that bus has got on-route charging, uh, on-route charging, which means, you know, as the bus goes between um, terminus to terminus, it, it takes a, an opportunity to, to charge itself. Um, so I suppose, yeah, look, so some of the things around um, hydrogen, Technology isn't as advanced, but as we are starting to see in China, there's a lot of, um, once China starts investing in it, uh, which they are, they start to drive the cost down uh, of fuel cells. Um, so we're starting to see the hydrogen buses still coming in around about a, around a million. Uh, but one of the things with hydrogen fundamentally is that you need to generate three times the amount of energy for a hydrogen bus than a battery electric, because by the time you've created the hydrogen, switched it back, switched it forward. Um, so to basically, get um, 100 uh, watts of energy to the to the hydrogen uh, bus, you need to have um, basically created 300 watts of energy versus uh, battery electric, where you have to create around 120 watts. It's only about, the difference is only about 15%. And so that's one of the fundamental issues with, with hydrogen, particularly around um, renewable energy. So some things around um, ownership and operations. Um, so starting to think around what are some of the different models um, so this is probably more for operators and, and state governments, but one of the things is, um, you know, I don't know if any of you know how aircrafts work, but um, often the airlines don't actually own their aircraft, they kind of lease, somebody owns the engines, um, somebody owns the planes, and so I suppose starting to look at some of these different financing models um, to um, bring on electric buses sooner. You know, we do toll roads um, through an availability charge. Uh, why couldn't we buy electric buses and do something similar through, you know, a per kilowatt uh, energy charge to get them built um, faster and sooner? And also to drive that affordability if people are worried about um, that gap. For example, you know, we are talking big numbers. So to switch all 8,000 buses in New South Wales, uh, you can imagine at $750,000 a pop, you know, we're talking about three and a half billion dollars. And then when you put, we add new depots on top of that, it's quite expensive. So um, there's a lot of private capital that's very interested in um, coming through and um, changing that. So I was sort of, I was always kind of nice to think around what the char change is. So this is a three kilowatt charge, uh, three megawatt charger uh, at, a, at a depot. Um, so these buses kind of pull in here, they charge over a couple of hours. But I sort of want to kind of highlight when we start to scale this up, you can start to see some of the challenges is that um, that depot is uses about the same energy as a, um, probably a medium sized regional town. So you can imagine um, the amount of draw 
um, that's going to create, but it starts to talk about energy storage on site. So you actually, when you think about all those buses, they are actually just like a giant battery. And so, you know, there's some people are talking about vehicle to grid, uh, which means, you know, you can charge them up when the solar or you can use solar energy uh, with a storage battery on site. The buses come in at night and then you, you draw down the energy um, off that storage battery, whether it's, you know, people have been talking about liquid air batteries and, um, and, and, and another battery type. So one of the things when we're starting to think about um, electric buses is actually starting to consider them uh, as part of creating resilience in the energy network and helping our, our move to, to renewable energy. The other thing that's kind of exciting, if we can get this right and we can start the transition and we can get these vehicles built here, if we can build an electric bus, it means we can build an electric rubbish truck. It means we can build a, a small electric delivery a vehicle, same chassis, same battery, same driver. So one of the things is that when we start to kind of expand our why electric buses are kind of so important and if we can get the transition going, we can actually start to see the decarbonisation of a lot of our, um, our industry. Um, again, you know, if we can get the fuel cell bus up, we might be able to get a fuel cell rubbish truck. And I suppose, you know, we start to think about all the complaints um, that you guys might receive around, you know, dirty buses stopping outside people's houses, the noise, just think about how that all goes um, overnight once you go to a, a clean uh, electric uh, bus in terms of uh, fuel economy as well. I suppose last slide, um, always think, you know, it's always nice to kind of touch on systems thinking, um, just to kind of kind of remind ourselves uh, the complexity that we're trying to sort out at the moment. I have kind of talked about a lot of this, but, you know, thinking around the opportunities, thinking about the energy companies, thinking around the depot requirements, um, and the like. So tomorrow, uh, last slide. Uh, so tomorrow we release a uh, report with UITP. Um, so we held this forum for nine weeks. Um, so we did the discussion paper. We had a forum with 270 people across governments across Australia. They then have made those really fantastic commitments, which is fantastic. Um, and now we've done a bit of a digest. Um, so you'll be able to, um, if you've got my LinkedIn profile, you'll be able to find it on there. And that will talk about key findings during the forum. The main things is that we said in terms of the transition, we need people to make long-term commitments to ZEBS. We need them to also set in motion short-term actions. Though sometimes people might think that's more a state government thing. There's a lot of things that local government can do in terms of pressuring uh, for electric buses to be run in their municipality. Um, also thinking about what are some of the emission standards they might start setting um, as well. This is probably a bit more of a national thing, but there is a role for Osroads and the National Transport Commission to think about regulatory uh, frameworks. The other thing is even just this conversation today, I'm more than happy and always, uh, always uh, able, uh, happy to make myself available to talk about the benefits uh, and help educate stakeholders and why the transition of ZEBS uh, for our decarbonised economy and transport system is just so fundamentally important that we get it started as soon as possible. Because if we buy one diesel bus today, that diesel bus will still be on the road in 2045, uh, potentially even going into 2050. So um, because they last 25 years, and sometimes once we even stop doing public transport rounds, they then get sold to school runs. And so then they might be on a school run for another 10 years, and then maybe, who knows, maybe they're on a, um, a pub crawl after that. So that's why we're sort of saying every diesel bus you buy today, you've got to think it's going to be here in 2050. Uh, the thing is around coordination and cohesion, so getting stakeholders and jurisdictions to work, and then um, hopefully reducing some of the uncertainty around technology, financing, infrastructure and operations. And so that last point as a, as a consultant, that's probably where I'm dedicating most of my time to make sure that I can take the uncertainty to allow uh, governments, operators and finance firms to make those decisions to invest. So that's me. Hopefully I stayed on time, uh, Jonathan and Jane, or did I go over? Uh Perfect. It, it was a few minutes and it okay. was worth every second.